much like Felix. Um, I'm actually going to use this so I can use my notes whilst they speak. Um, also, between Clinton's and AI, I worked at Boilery, and that plays into some of this because I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about brand, brands. Um, so, hello, not that one. That one, yay. Um, so, Chris gave me this title, and it's quite good to be tall, uh, but it's quite broad, and um, I specialise primarily in music, but I also do uh, a lot of work with YouTubers and uh, with broadly entertainment practices, um, or entertainment practice. And um, I thought rather than talking about music specifically, I'm going to talk about some of the common pitfalls and um, ways in which uh, the laws are being broken, to my eyes, in the, in the digital media place currently. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start by talking about branded content, uh, then I'm going to go on to social media, and I'm going to end by talking a little bit about YouTube. So who's breaking the law? The brands are breaking the law. Uh, quite a lot actually. Uh, this is a very um, recent example of it. Uh, it's a BuzzFeed article. Um, the brand involved is Dylon Colour Catcher. And uh, they created a piece of advertorial uh, with BuzzFeed and um, it fell full of the advertising standards regulations in the UK uh, because the average consumer when looking at that was not convinced or would not be able to immediately tell that it was a piece of advertising. And the reason why that was decided was because the content was organised in exactly the same way uh, that a normal article on BuzzFeed would be. Um, presented. So you can determine whether it's editorial basically on the way that it was presented. Uh, and also, although on the homepage um, BuzzFeed wrote that it was sponsored content, when you clicked through uh, and went to the article itself, or if you indeed found the article via any other means, for instance Twitter or recommendation basis, then the actual article itself did not say this is a piece of sponsored content. Uh, what it did have, however, Uh, is instead of where it would normally have a face of the journalist and the name of the journalist, it instead said that the piece was written by Dylon, but it was deemed that that wasn't enough and they had to be clearer. So if you are working with brands um, as, a, as a manager, as an artist, as a platform, um, make sure that you are incredibly explicit about the way that you um, indicate the sponsored nature of the content. Here's another one, um, the Oreo Lick Challenge. Has anybody heard of this? Yeah, you've had it, great. Uh, so a while ago, Oreo sent a set of rules, a sort of, uh, a sort of gamified um, Oreo eating by asking YouTubers with obviously large audiences to take an Oreo, uh, twist it apart, uh, lick the inside white stuff off and then gobble it down as quickly as possible against another competitor and the winner uh, would uh, give the other a challenge to do. Uh, and they approached about 10 different UK YouTubers, all of whom, uh, or at least they probably approached many more besides, but all of whom did it and all of whom had their video content removed subsequently as a result of, the fab of advertising standards. Uh, and even though for me, um, as I've managed to find some of these on Reddit and in weird places, um, for me it's quite apparent that this is an advert because you've got a set of rules, um, the vlogger is telling you they've received it from Oreo uh, and they are you know, obviously the product is in the video. Um, what uh, the Advertising Standards Agency said is that they've, um, although it's clear that there's a product tie-in, it wasn't clear that it's a commercial tie-in, uh, and that the commerciality of the fact that the YouTubers were, uh, vloggers were being paid meant that the content wasn't pure content uh, that they were actually in control of, and therefore they had to be super careful and the content must come down. So here's just a few like pretty easy pointers. Uh, you should, um, if you're using hashtags, a hashtag ad obviously indicates it's an ad. It's a, you know three letters, three digits. Uh, pretty easy. You should put the name of the sponsor, the fact that it is sponsored content, uh, and when you're trying to determine whether you need to do this or not, you should think about the fact that whether your relationship with the brand is commercial in nature, i.e., being paid, um, and secondly, if you have control over the relationship, sorry, if you have control over the content. Um, uh, actually, I thought, this is a bit tedious because it actually is real hard law, but I thought I'd just read to you the bit that you need to have in your mind um, when you're deciding this. So, the Consumer Protection um, from Unfair Trading Regulations in 2008 said, a commercial practice is unfair if it contravenes the requirements of professional diligence uh, and materially distorts the economic behaviour of the average consumer in relation to a product, or is likely to. 
Um, so that's what you kind of need to bear in mind. Uh, that's the brown bit done. Now users are breaking the law, consumers are breaking the law, they don't know they're necessarily doing it. Uh, and that's because ultimately um, people are using social media as a um, going down the pub bedroom chat uh, kind of platform. And in actual fact they are publishers, they are publishing content and if they are retweeting um, or manipulating content and um, disseminating that content, if that content breaks the law then technically the person posting and reposting it is also breaking the law. Uh, and what we've seen um, over the last few years is some of the first cases where users are actually being essentially sued um, by uh, people who feel that their rights have been infringed. And here's a few examples. The first one is Lord McAlpine, who famously sued um, uh, Twitter users. He was, um, he's in the UK a conservative peer, so he's a politician. Um, uh, he, a BBC uh, programme came out that talked about a well-known conservative peer who was a paedophile. They didn't mention the name. Uh, obviously then a witch hunt ensued where everybody on Twitter was trying to determine who this person was. Uh, an absolute <laughs> Twitter storm ensued. Uh, somebody decided it was Lord McAlpine. Everyone then decided it was Lord McAlpine. It wasn't Lord McAlpine. <laughs> so he obviously got his reputation dragged through the dirt and decided to bring cases not just against the um, well-known public figures who were um, tweeting about this and mentioning it, but also the average consumer. Uh, and I think his lawyers initially were supposed to be pursuing absolutely everybody who'd done, who'd said anything or name referenced him in relation to this case, but then they decided to only opt to pursue the people who had over 500 followers, but are still a lot of people. Um, and he actually was, um, he managed to get from the comedian Alan Davies, he got £15,000 in damages as a result of his tweets on this particular point, which he donated to a children's charity subsequently. But you can see that this is, it is a damage, um, you would get damages as opposed to sort of find yourself in prison. It's a civil, not a criminal action. But it's something you have to be alive and aware to. You should, if you're working with artists, you should try your best to educate them so they're not just, you know, retweeting something that they think is amusing and thereby getting stuck into a sticky situation uh, and also just educating them that they should, you know, warning signs if uh, they're posting anything really whatsoever, even if it's from their own mind, their own opinion, if it clearly is, for example, defaming a third party. Um, oh, sorry, I also should have mentioned there was a few other cases. But incitement is a really big problem as well. So incitement is like encouraging somebody else to do something, right? So incitement uh, could be inciting terrorism, it could be inciting racial hatred. Uh, in London we have a lot of cases about um, the riots. There were some riots in London a few years ago. And people were taking to Twitter to say, go to the post office and smash it up. And then people subsequently did that. And then, of course, they had criminal actions brought against them for inciting violence in London. Um, so just be very, very careful and aware and, and look after your artists and, and your businesses when you're, when you're making your social media uh, posts and decisions. I just put that up there to scare you all. Uh, those are all the things that you could do and be found liable for. <laughs> So um, if anybody wants to talk about those in more detail, then come and see me afterwards. Um, next. So YouTube is um, somehow managing to get around the law when everybody else seems to be breaking the law and sued for it. And um, the reason why they kind of managed to get away with quite a bit more um, is because they have a defence, and it's called the mere conduit defence. And um, the mere conduit defence was first in, um, brought into power, into force in the UK in um, the early 19th century, um, sorry, in the 1800s when uh, BT, the British Telecoms provider in the UK, uh, started to lay telephone wires under, um, under the ground and, in the, um, and pass, them across, um, pass them across the UK. And the question arose when they were putting all this investment of time into the wiring, what happens if somebody um, on a telephone call commits a crime? And the crime, it would not have happened but for the passage of information on this wire. And we in the wire, does that mean that we will be found guilty of the offence or, you know, by proxy liable in some way? Um, and the answer was, um, yes, you would be, uh, so shit, we better do something about it. And what they did about it was brought in this defence and their conduit. And the mere conduit defence basically says, I am but a pipeline, uh, as long as I have no actual knowledge of what is going on on my lines, then, um, and as long as I'm not directly um, 
monetizing that content. Um, uh, and as long as if I'm told that there has been a crime committed, I do something about it, then I can claim validly that I am you know, an inactive party in this passage of information uh, and thereby not liable. Um, and so YouTube has got this incredible defense and, and, um, and therefore infringing copyright can and can and does remain and reside throughout its channels and throughout its platforms uh, uh, in sort of like bubble, which is quite incredible. And the way that plays out, as you will probably have noticed, is there are essentially two sides to the YouTube business. There is the monetized content side, uh, and then there's the non-monetized content side. And in the monetized content side, YouTube is um, in touch with what is on there. They uh, curate, they create, they pay for the content in some cases. Um, and they set ads against it, and uh, they are responsible for the copyright infringement that is in that copyright, that is in that content. Uh, on the other side, uh, there's lots of user-generated content, and there are no adverts because if they were deemed to know what was in that content, they would say that they serve ads against it, uh, then they would probably fall foul of this provision. Um, so, one minute. Oh, <laughs> right, time's really quickly. Uh, uh, just. One, one final point. Um, the expeditious, um, expeditious removal is in fact the takedown notice that you guys will be familiar of. Uh, and um, if they receive a takedown notice in respect to content, they must take it down. Um, but you have to give them the specific URL for the content you want removed. Uh, because if they were to be expected to look at everything, again, they would fall outside of this. And then their general business model would be in jeopardy. So that's it in a nutshell, there's so much more I've got to say, but has anybody got any questions just before we pass over to the next speaker? Oh, <laughs> Thanks guys.